Hello, uh, good day or good night, whatever time you're watching this, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, hello and welcome. My name's Andrew Collinson. I'm Research Director of SDL Partners. And um, I suppose I'm here because the state of the industry is my responsibility in the sense that um, back at Christmas time, I was thinking, believe it or not, I'm going to miss being at Mobile World Congress. Normally, I'm thinking about packing my bags about that time. And I was thinking, oh, no, God, not again. But actually, I was thinking, I'm really going to miss, and I'm really going to miss the conversations. So we thought, how can we recreate those conversations that you have, those interesting times that you have when you, you get into that intense environment and meet all the people who know so much more stuff than you do and, and share that information. And so this is the third of three such sessions that we're doing. I hope you've got a cup of tea, coffee, a croissant, or whatever it is that kind of reminds you of that experience. It's Thursday morning in Barcelona. It's normally the time you have the best conversations because people are a little bit more relaxed uh, and uh, you know have a little bit more time. Some housekeeping for the call today. You're in listen-only mode. If you need us, please type in a comment. You should have a control panel that you can see that. Please put your questions in. I will be keeping an eye on those um, during during the panel and bringing them into the conversation as best I can. Um, you know, to, to go with the flow and we'll try and pick up any at the end. And we'll send you the slides and the recording uh, shortly after the session. And do tweet us at STL Partners and by all means, uh, you know, connect with myself, Dahlia, anyone you wish to. So that's the housekeeping over. I mentioned it was part of three and I'd just like to give you a very quick overview of what we found this week. So on Tuesday, we were talking about priorities, strategic priorities, and we're lucky enough to be joined by uh, Rainer Deutschmann, who's Group Chief Operating Officer of Telia. And, and Dean, uh, a long-time colleague and associate of, of ours. And um, really the highlight, I think, about the big thing that came out of that for me was change is back in town. Transformation is really back in town now, but it's, an, it's different. It, it's a new game. You know, if you talked about it five years ago, you were talking about bringing in technologies. You know, how do we, how do we make this or that new technology work? That's still a part of it, but I think what's been recognized is there are a number of other things. It's a much more holistic view of transformation. It's about understanding needs. It's about people and how they work with technology. It's about changing, and it's about being organizations that continuously adapt and innovate. And I would say, as research director of Sales Partners, Telcos have actually done a brilliant job of adapting during COVID. The question is, have they done enough innovation? That would be my challenge to the industry. Um, Day two, uh, Amy uh, very brilliantly chaired that uh, discussion between uh, Lisa and Annette. And what was interesting about that, that was a discussion about the new opportunities. What are the new opportunities for telcos to grasp? And the big, I was talking to Amy about this this morning, the, the big insight she gleaned from that, um, or you know, the overarching insight is that it's about process and structure. The people who are being successful have you know, developed and are evolving processes and structures to make good decisions about what things they're going to invest in, what new things they're going to do. <clears throat> and that kind of makes sense. If you live in a world of continuous innovation, it's not like you have one fixed priority. Things move around all the time. You have to be focused, and it's about where you focus your attention. So I thought that was very interesting. And by the way, recordings of those are available to those registered. So, uh, we, you know, you should be able to get those from us too. I think, I think they're worth watching myself. Um, today, and I'm, I'm shortly going to hand over to Dahlia, but just to put this in, in context, we thought the other thing we should look at is what about the technology side? What about the, the, the hottest, most interesting changes in technology? And two of those, the two, you know, perhaps two of the buzzwords that everybody's thinking about, you know, the, the high, you know, arguably hype. I don't think so. I think, I think there's interesting stuff in both, obviously. And that's what we're about to talk about, a 5G and edge. And I'm going to hand over to Dahlia now to introduce and manage the panel. Um, Dahlia, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. I'm really looking forward to the session today. Um, so we've got three panelists uh, with me, Jen, Tree, and Gordon, all of whom are from some of the uh, companies in the telecoms industry who are really leading and shaping what the 5G and Edge opportunity will look like. Um, I'll allow them to introduce themselves once we get uh, onto the panel discussion. Uh, and you can find out a little bit more about what they are working on when it comes to edge computing. Just to start off with, I thought it'd be worth um, providing a bit of insight uh, from an STL partner's perspective of what we see is happening um, around uh, edge computing and particularly what we've seen in the last year. Um, so just to introduce uh, STL's edge practice quickly, um, that's something that I head up. We've been looking at edge computing for over four years now and worked with 
um, both telecoms operators and increasingly non-telcos to um, advise them on what the edge opportunity looks like, what are the use cases and which industries are really going to be um, adopters of edge technology, how it will work with 5G and when is 5G not so relevant, um, as well as you know things like what's the business model um, that, that will work, which type of edge, how do you build the edge, all that sort of thing. So. Um, for those who don't know, we have an Edge Hub on our website where we publish lots of articles, webinar, webinars like this, and reports um, on the top of, topic of Edge um, almost every two weeks. So do check that out. So in terms of Edge computing, um, I guess one thing uh, which came out of the survey that Andrew um, actually ran in December and January, so he's, he's run this survey um, for over a year now, uh, and it was really looking, trying to look at the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on the telecoms industry and how that was changing priorities and sort of investments in the short term and long term. Um, I think the, uh, the, the, the research has been published now. You can, I guess you can find it on our website. And there's some really um, rich findings around you know, investments and priorities when it comes to general digital transformation in the telecoms operator to sort of external opportunities, so where in the enterprise space, which industries are telcos most invested in, and also from a technology perspective. Um, and when it comes to Edge and 5G, I think one thing that was interesting in the recent um, release, so comparing what the telecoms industry was saying um, in last December and January compared to May 2020, is that there's been big shifts in, um, and sort of positive shifts um, in the Edge and the 5G space. Um, last year, you know, edge computing was still quite new and, um, you know, some t telecoms operators were at a very early stage of understanding what edge computing was all about and how it might relate to their business. Um, and clearly that's been a big shift. So it's not necessarily saying that telco edge is the number one priority within telecoms operators, but that, that it's faced one of the biggest shifts um, in an increase in priority in the last, um, uh, I guess, nine months or so. So uh, yeah, so that's something to frame, and obviously, you know, really looking forward to the panelists' views on you know what this is, what this has meant for them in their role, and and why this is happening. Um, but just thought I'd frame that so it you know it's clearly a, a bigger priority. And part of that, you know, we've seen one of the indicators has been um, the partnerships between the cloud, the hyperscale cloud providers, so AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google in particular, and telecoms operators. And you know some of the, these partnerships, um, I guess you know, happened sort of early uh, 2020 or even before that. But there's been uh, uh, many new partnerships, and you know this is obviously a bit of a snapshot. Some of the partnerships are um, fairly mature, and obviously some of the panelists are in those relatively mature partnerships with the cloud providers and are working um, actively to deploy uh, edge sites and build uh, and deliver new services off the back of the partnerships, others that are a more uh, nascent stage. But it'll be really interesting to see how this evolves. And this is obviously only one indicator. We have other telecoms operators building their own edges, uh, building their own edges, looking at private, the role of private mobile networks and edge computing, um, as well as, you know, expanding even their network services to ensure that um, the networks can support edge as well. The thing is, though, is that sometimes, I guess, in the telecoms operate, uh, telecoms industry, we have a bit of a very telco view of what edge computing really is, and it's important to just take a step back and understand what telco edge looks like in um, the broader context of investments in data centers and cloud generally. And the reality is, it's, a, it's, a, it's still at a, a fairly early stage. So we, as STL, have been tracking investments, and here we mean. Um, you know, in, in organic investment, um, so mergers and acquisitions, um, as well as minority investments like from uh, private equity and venture capital. And what we've seen in the last um, four years, so this is up to the end of 2020, um, is that, you know, there's, there is huge investment going into the to telecoms networks, and that's driven largely by the telecoms operators themselves. We estimate it's about, you know, 350 billion over that period. There's a lot of investment going uh, from the hyperscale cloud providers themselves, investing their own um, uh, in, in their own cloud data centers. And obviously this is a little bit of an estimate because some of that information is not public. And if you look at edge investments and what we've tracked, it's, a, it's been about the $2 billion mark in the last four years. And clearly that's increasing 
um, each month. And you're, you're hearing announcements from some of the large investors and large data center companies who are increasingly investing in edge computing as well. The other thing that's important to say is that $2 billion doesn't include the money that's um, being invested by the telecoms operators themselves organically in their own um, in their own data centers. So um, it may be understating, you know, how much investment is going in edge. But the main point is that, you know, we're still at a relatively early stage and, um, and you know, at the end of the day, edge is going to complement the cloud. Um, and so, yeah, it, I guess it's just important putting that perspective uh, in. In terms of where some of that investment is going. So again, you know, a, a lot of the investment at the moment has been in building that foundation. So building the facilities themselves. Here, we're just looking at, um, investment across different parts of the value chain but already we're starting to see that trickle down into um, levels higher up the value chain so that's uh, that includes the edge cloud infrastructure so things like um, you know startups creating cloud orchestration or um, sort of containerization and management platforms um, as well as the application and the software that sit on top of that whether that's you know analytics platforms or um, the end applications themselves It'll be really interesting in the next year or so to see how that trickles down. But um, I think the main takeaway is, you know, there's a lot of um, traction now. We are reaching a, a sort of an inflection point when it comes to edge computing, but it's still a, a very, very early stage. And I think what we, you know, what we'd love to do in this, um, in the panel today, is find out a little bit more about how um, telcos and others are going to invest in that space, where the where the demand is, and where the the opportunity is that will really boost the edge compute um, market. Um, and yeah, sorry, one last thing actually is looking a little bit at the type of edge that's being invested. So again, um, there's a lot of you know interest and excitement around things like um, what we call the tower edge. So really putting mini edge data centers at base stations. Um, that's quite, you know, that's at the moment, it's a sort of a, a more forward looking, more futuristic view of where edge will be. What we're seeing um, is that most of the say external investment in edge computing is happening at the regional data center space. So you're seeing acquisitions by large data center companies of smaller data center companies who have regional data centers, uh, particularly in places like the US and maybe Australia, where um, there is a need to invest in, um, in data center infrastructure in sort of tier two cities, which are still you know, pretty big um, uh, areas. Um, network edge, which uh, here I guess we'd pass as um, places at telco points of presence or telco sites, um, which are maybe further back in the network, so aggregation points. And this is a lot where we're seeing telcos are investing in um, their infrastructure and adding edge compute infrastructure, not only to host their own network uh, functions, but to host third party applications, which is obviously the key topic for today. And again, you know, this is looking at an external perspective, so we don't have insight on how much telcos themselves are investing in the network edge, but clearly some of that capital investment that we saw on the other side is feeding into this and, not, and not just going in the direct networking elements of, um, of their capital investments. Idea. So hopefully that's a, an interesting um, introduction of where we are with edge computing. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and bring uh, the panelists into uh, into the, the frame. So first thing, as I said, um, I really wanted to give everyone an, a, a chance to introduce themselves. Um, so without further ado, uh, Jen, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jen Didoni. I head up the um, cloud portfolio and product management team in Vodafone Business, so responsible for our cloud-oriented services that we sell anywhere from um, Soho all the way at a small, medium business, all the way up to multinational. Thanks, Jen. And um, I guess, can you describe a little bit around, obviously, what Vodafone's doing in Edge and kind of your role um, within that? Yeah, sure. So. Um, at Vodafone, we, as as Dahlia, you um, you you were engaged right from the get go when we were starting to form the taxonomy of the way we talked about edge. We talk um, mainly about two types of edge: uh, the dedicated edge and the distributed edge. Where um, dedicated edge is looking to bring um, cloud-like infrastructure onto a customer premise, combining it with a mobile private network and giving them a dedicated, um, secure, highly performant network and cloud 
that can be managed um, as uh, in, with the familiar tools and experience that you would get from um, from a, a public cloud or a regional cloud. Then the distributed edge is where we um, we um, place um, cloud computing infrastructure in strategic locations within our 4G and 5G um, network. So I think akin to what you were describing as the the telco edge, uh, Dahlia. In in that space, we've partnered with. AWS and we will be imminently launching in the UK and in um, in Germany next quarter. Um, on the dedicated edge side, we are working with Microsoft um, as our as our partner. So we've kind of spread across um, a couple different partners. We, we also have a strong partnership with IBM in the multi-cloud space. So we also provide tools um, to manage multiple clouds, which we see as becoming more and more important. Um, even if a customer isn't working with multiple hyperscalers, which is rare, but also they're now going to be working with multiple types of cloud because I, I would never say that you're going to go all, all out and all in to the edge, um, but you've got to choose the right workload and the right applications to run from the edge. There might be some in the regional, there might be some on, on premise and, and kind of optimizing that estate, I, I think is, um, is where customers will gain competitive advantage from cloud in the future. Great. Um, yeah, so, I mean, clearly I guess Vodafone's um, pretty far ahead when it comes to starting to shape some of the services and I think it'd be interesting to hear a bit about your experience in getting there. Um, Maybe let's just, uh, so first of all, I guess let's uh, hand over to Gordon. If you can give us a bit of a view of, you know, yourself, obviously, introduce yourself, and then um, again, you know, what Verizon's doing in this space. Thank you, Dahlia. My name's Gordon Hewitt. I work for the International Innovation and 5G team at Verizon. So most of what I look at is, is outside the North American market. Um, but back in the North American market, uh, we, we too have a uh, a partnership with AWS where we're deploying 5G Edge um, into our mobile network to provide lower latency, uh, real-time compute capabilities for our customers in the US market. And we're looking at, at deploying a private uh, MEC capability for the international customers um, in the 2021 uh, calendar year. Um, part of our business in terms of Verizon Media has also been working with MEC technology for quite some time. So uh, we have a lot of work going on looking at how to build the ecosystem for MEC with uh, multiple hypervisor um, options for customers, but also that uh, application ecosystem that would work with MEC to provide that real-time enterprise that both 5G and Edge provide. Good stuff. Um, and then Tree, last but not least. Tree, I think your microphone's on mute. Yep, sorry about that. Hi, yeah, so I'm the uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Tata Communication Strategy, Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Tata Communication. So, a lot of what we do on terms of edge is still sort of label on the innovation. It's not quite productized yet. Uh, and we're still in a stage where we're trying to really shape the strategy in a lot, much more clear. When we were doing a lot of little things, but I don't think it's, I would say that we have like a clear edge strategy of how exactly what we're going to do yet. Uh, but some of the things that we're, we're doing on, on the more mature side is, is really sort of about enabling different uh, applications uh, and, and solutions to deploy their edge solutions to the customer. So we try to play in a part of the stack, right? And I think one of the things about telecommunications communications that we, we um, position ourselves is that we're a digital ecosystem enabler. So we work a lot with partners to help them achieve, you know, in terms of their digital solutions and digital transformation. And so one area that we're, we're a little bit more established is we have a lot of these agile solutions to help various uh, edge solutions out there for the customers which are now in the market selling. So for example, we were part of the uh, Microsoft Azure private edge zones when they're rolling out their, you know, their MEX. We're one of the 
couple embedded networking solution that they put into their their edge solution so that when customers ready to use it they can automatically turn on and have the applications set up a, a network a secure using zero trust with at the right at the beginning so it's all embedded into the, the azure azure private edge so that's and and then another solution we have is you know we working with micron in their authenta for the iot devices and again we actually have an embedded eSIM into the chip so when the chip goes out and is part of a overall iot edge solution our eSIM solution is actually embedded into the chip and it's zero touch everything is done secured it can all be managed through the applications and not necessarily through the traditional boxes so those are some of the things that were more established that we're doing and we're playing sort of small part of the stack but we also want to play sort of a more of what our traditional role in terms of managed service providers for the for the enterprise and helping them with their network and also now helping them with their edge rollout right in terms of being these on the more in the managed service side and that means we need to provide a more end-to-end -end solution and that means working with a variety of partners and helping them address from the infrastructure to the applications to the hypervisors and being able to provide a layer of orchestration uh, that that allows the uh, us to manage it on behalf of the customer. So that's probably, I think, the bigger area where we will, we're still working on in terms of how that will play out. But that's sort of broadly what we're trying to do in terms of the edge side. Mm. I mean, it seems like even if it's some of it's exploratory, it seems like there's a there's a lot going on. Um, I'm interested because all three of you are sort of, um, you know, you're you are part of an enterprise business and so you're you know very much customer facing and some of the discussion around telco edge can sometimes be you know very technology focused um and obviously we've you know we've just and we're still going through this last year of um a kind of a strange situation um but at the same time it's been you know a, i guess an important year for edge computing um as as i was saying in my presentation you know, there's a bit of a um, at least we're reaching an inflection if it's not the inflection point already. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know from, I guess from everyone, but what you've been hearing from customers, um, you know, are they are they actively asking about edge computing or is it more a case of, you know, you're having to educate them about what edge computing really is. Just be interested to know where we're at from a customer perspective. Um, I don't know, yeah, Jen, if you wanna kick us off. Yeah, sure. Um, I was just thinking of if can I generalize this? I think it's so different depending on the customer. Um, some of them are very, very clear on the use case, how they want to architect it, and sort of will will come to us with a very specific set of requirements. Other mm -hmm. customers um, are curious about the technology and asking like. Is it relevant for us? Are there use cases in our industry that you're seeing that we could take advantage of, of this new innovation coming? Um, and then there are others who are familiar with the use case, but looking to understand what's the underlying technology that would actually make that use case perform at the, at the level that they need to. So super diverse. And I would say um, for, for Vodafone, it's, Probably the the biggest change is the the nature of the customers that we're working with. So typically, I think we we sell into the enterprise, right? The multinational corporates. But, um, but we're now having a lot of conversations as well with SIs, with ISVs. Um, so that sort of ecosystem is is really broadening as as a result of the type of technology that we're bringing to market. Mm -hmm. That's super interesting. That's and do you see, conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do you see like um, any, I mean, maybe you're saying it's too hard to draw any trends, but you know, you mentioned there are some customers who have an idea of which use cases and even have an idea of how they want to architect those use cases. Do they tend to be either from a type of industry or set, set of use cases, or even if maybe it's a type of edge that seems to be a bit more mature? Yeah, so I would say um, some of the perhaps um, more ob obvious use cases are sort of more well understood as use cases that would benefit from edge, like 
um, video analytics or computer vision or um, V to X. Those customers have been looking at this space and thinking about this space for a while because clearly the edge is a super enabler of, of that particular use case. So I think that's probably where the, the market is more mature in their thinking of the architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sorry, Gordon, you, I think you were going to say something. I, I agree with, with Jen's uh, assumptions around or observations around the customers. We're noticing that um, first off when we're talking 5G and, and Edge, because we see them as being parts of the same ecosystem, um, that initially we were educating a lot of customers around the possibilities of you know, real-time enterprise, but now we're starting to see a fair amount of understanding and those conversations are turning into more you know, what can you do for our business? The, the other change that we're seeing is that instead of talking into the technology parts of enterprises, we're starting to broaden that conversation out. So the business case is, is actually based upon business outcomes as much as it, as it is technological investment and payback on that technology investment. So I, I think with COVID driving masses of change in the enterprise we're starting to see a different view of how technology can enable uh, i hate the term but the new normal mm -hmm. yeah i uh, i like just to add that um you know i think that as 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 you and andrew point i think there's a a lot more activity over the last 12 months um a lot of the and, and for us it's a lot of it's still sort of proof of concepts but now it's actually proof of concepts with very defined use case for what they want, right? So it's like I said, it's not just about handholding, about technology. It's about a specific use case, you know, be it, I want to do something for in the auto industry or in my factory or my retail stores or in uh, going out to remote, remote areas where I, I need more, you know, I need more automation of certain things, so less, less, uh, less uh, manual work. And, and so there's very specific use case, but usually what happens during the process of working it out and doing a proof of concept is people are learning and things do change so that's the thing the point we, we all have to be right now it's incredibly agile so they are very specific use cases, but use those use cases evolve pretty quickly and sometimes can be quite different from what the original mm -hmm. intentions are or how they want to do it um, so th that's the the sort of anatomy of what we we're seeing today and like i said there's a, a lot more activity but for us it's still very much sort of proof proof of concepts, not not necessarily large scale rollouts yet, but that's what we hope to see in the next, I think maybe in the next 12 to 24 months, we'll see more of that kind of activity. Mm -hmm. And maybe this, um, I guess, yeah, one thing that we've been hearing is, or I guess debating is how ready telecoms operators are for those types of engagements. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, maybe it's unfair to say with the organizations, um, you've been in the enterprise space for, a long time, um, but at least with maybe other telecoms operators, you know, historically their enterprise business may have been about selling mobile sims um, to business customers, and that's a very different skill um, because you know it's a pre-packaged um, product and it's pretty horizontal. Whereas now you you know you've all kind of been discussing how you need to understand use cases and business outcomes, and it's also everything's a moving process. So maybe what you think you'll sell you know, sell the customer and at the beginning is going to be different to what you do at the end. How are you, you know, organizationally managing that and has it been a challenge or have you already, I guess, started that change before edge computing was part of the picture? It's an interesting point, Dahlia. Um, we're definitely seeing a lot more multinational corporation conversations around 5G and Edge, um, where we're looking at a, a global strategy or a global tactical proof of concept to, to prove how it's going to work multinationally. And, and as soon as we go multinational, you know, the, the whole um, SIMS and, and bundles um, conversation changes because, you know, we as a company, we're not a mobile network operator outside the US. So um, unlike Vodafone, who's got a number of countries where they operate as MNOs with different opcos, 
we, we tend to focus more on those business conversations globally. And I think that the, you know, the SIMS and, and bundles conversation is not relevant when we're talking about global strategy, right? So I think it's separate, at least that's what we see. Mm -hmm. but, but are your like other teams that you're working with, basically, you know, the sales teams, the go-to-market organization, are they equipped to, I mean, Verizon's a bit different because like you say in the US, sure you have the, the SIMs and the bundles conversation, but outside of that, I suppose it's more fixed network. SD WAN type um, offering, but still pretty product size and pretty horizontal. So, has there, you know, has there been a need to change yet, or um, have you already, you know, made that change? So, our US um, wireless teams are all working hand in hand with the US wireline teams, and we're upskilling everybody in terms of understanding the 5G ecosystem, 5G. Mech and that enterprise focus. So I think our business is moving towards, uh, as we said earlier, a business outcome conversation a lot more than we, we were, you know, last year or the year before. Mm -hmm. And um, Jen, what, I mean, how about you in, at Vodafone? Yeah, sure. So I would say, um, the good news for me, because I'm obviously like very focused on edge, but I think there's a macro change happening across Vodafone um, where we've sort of said, look, our strategy is to be a tech comms company, not a telco um, company, and really building in a lot more um, technology into the DNA of what we do. Um, so building out some of our software development skills, um, sales, specialists rather than sales generalists um, and so that kind of transformation is sort of happening at a macro level I'm benefiting from it of course um, but also looking at how do we drive our cloud specialization even deeper into go-to-market and um, technical expertise in that space um, so so yeah, it, it does involve a change. I'm very happy to see the change coming. I've wanted to see this change for a long time in our industry. So I think it's fantastic. And I, I don't think we're alone in that transformation either. I, I think the whole industry is transforming, to be honest, because especially, you know, as Gordon was talking about his wired business, you know, that has gone from plug and play to software defined. And that means it is by nature a cloud service, and therefore we should be thinking about ourselves as a as a cloud player de facto. Um, the difference between being a connectivity player and a cloud player, to me, is very uh, is very thin at the moment. Yeah, well, I agree. I think everything that a telco does will eventually be a SaaS, right? I mean, everything that that's that's the way it's moving, and it's interesting when you. I think when you point out at the beginning of your presentation, the number two item is is recruiting, right, talent, and that's the probably the biggest challenge for any telco uh, mm -hmm. as part of this transition. I think, um, as I mentioned, I think from a from a customer dialogue now, especially if you're talking about things like Edge 5G, it is a very much of a solutions consultative dialogue, and you need people to have that kind of a mindset, uh, an architect of solutions, rather than the traditional, you know, to the sales uh, uh, telco sales, and then. And the rest of the organization has to be a much more uh, software-oriented business, cloud software-oriented business, and and therefore that requires a different skill sets. Um, like I said, all the, the things that we're doing today that we're excited about is when we're providing our, our our network in a virtualized way, where it's actually interacting with the applications directly, and that that requires us putting a totally different team to doing that. And we're a big part of our business is trying to shift you know upskilling the people we have but also bringing more and more software people and in terms of and and then turning the telecom business into a more of a platform business so mm -hmm. that that's sort of to me the biggest trend that we're seeing yeah it's interesting what you guys are all saying this you know this what's happening is that there's less of a delineation between networking and cloud and the skills to run one effectively is going to be the same as the other and um, we've had a few questions around the dynamic between telecoms operators and the car providers and i you know i guess what we've seen in the last year is that you know there's a need to partner partly because 
at this present point in time, there are differences in the, in the skills of the two organizations, even if that might change in the future. But um, one question we had um, from Warren is, um, which is, you know, uh, a bit of a maybe a bit of a devil's advocate question, but why, he's asking why would enterprises buy edge capabilities from telcos as opposed to from hyperscale car providers or IT vendors like IBM and Dell, all of whom telcos are partnering with? What's you know yeah why go to a telco? Um, uh, Jen, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think you know this the sort of why buy from a telco has gotten so much stronger that the response to that has gotten so much stronger over the course of, of the last couple of years. Um, and I think, I think it's about that, that integration of your network and your cloud, so the performance of your application and the ex digital experience you're delivering to whoever's consuming that application relies on a variety, variety of factors, right? It relies on the endpoint and the device they're using, the connectivity to get between that device and the cloud and the type of cloud that you're consuming. And there is a certain segment of customers, I think, that would, would rather say, hey, look, I, I, I don't want to be the arbiter between the connectivity provider and the cloud provider to figure out why my application and the experience isn't great for my end customer. Right. I, 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 I just want an excellent experience and one, one throat to, to choke for that. Um, and so I think, I, I think that's one of the key reasons that, that customers come to us. I also think another benefit of, of working with telcos, and maybe I'm saying something controversial, but I think we're great at delivering something um, once at scale, industrialized, globally, and delivering it as a reliable service with SLA wraps around it. And if that's how a customer wants to consume their cloud and network, um, it's a great reason to come to, to Telcos because they, they kind of already know that we deliver a reliable set of SLAs on a monthly basis. And that's sort of how we, at least in the enterprise space, we deliver our services to our customers as it stands today. Mm -hmm. but don't the cloud providers, I guess, also, I mean, maybe not provide SLAs in the same way, but they are deemed as, you know, they provide a very strong and reliable cloud service. Um, so do you see skepticism from customers or, you know, is it a bit different? So, so Dahlia, I just think on that point about don't they provide, um, you know, reliable services, et cetera, you still need a network to connect to them. And I think the difference between the IT vendors and the telco providers historically has been the relationship. That relationship between vendor and customer has been very different on the telco side. And as Jen, Jen was talking about, you know, the SLAs in a standard telco deployment, you know, it's five nines or it's nothing. In a standard IT deployment, it's it's always been, you know, three nines is good enough in terms of the availability. So the, the two if you like, industries haven't competed until recently. And I think that the, the relationship that telcos have with the, the mindset of the availability that they have is different. So that's why there is different conversations going on. When you bring into it this notion of needing network to connect into the hyperscalers, then you know there's there's another dimension where telco has more of an advantage than than IT so it's kind of clash of two philosophies but then the telco providers are also looking at going towards that as a service mentality um a lot more so than the the IT vendors are we're less interested in the tin and more interested in that customer relationship so selling a service and I'm generalizing hugely, right? But to, to me, that's the big difference. Yeah, actually, I, I want to go back to sort of some of the things that I think even STL has been pushing. I mean, like this is, I think the term, the age of co coordination age, I think it's the term that I think you guys are using. And I think and that's where the role that telco plays. And I was talking about as a, the managed service provider, right? And we, we, we thrive ourselves in being able to provide um, you know, enabling all the different players, right, the ecosystem, but also in terms of providing a holistic view of what's going on, right? And and because a lot of the edge solution isn't going to be a single vendor, it's not going to be a single cloud 
a single device, a single thing. That's going to be a composition of a lot of those things. And and to Jen's point about you know single throat, you kind of want someone to help you manage across all those different players, and also but give you the visibility of what's going on across those different things. And so and that's where I think the biggest opportunity for the telco is being able to provide that coordination platforms you would call it orchestration platform the ability to to see across those things provide a little bit more of a holistic yes we still be selling network we still be but we also have to make sure that we understand the partners and what we're doing and making it easier consumed by our partners and the fact that we're kind of a little bit more neutral yeah we may be pushing a certain network and to be honest for us now and now more and more we're moving up to bring your own network we're not really trying to push it but it's about the managed service aspect of that and that's how I think the, the sort of room for us to play to differentiate ourselves from the, the hyperscalers, the, the various OEMs that you mentioned, uh, Dali. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, you're interesting to talk about managed services. And I think, um, Jen, when you talk about what you've heard from customers, a lot of it, or well, some of it at least seems it's from maybe fairly large enterprises who have um, started looking at Edge, understand you know, what it's all about, understand how it might work for their business. And I guess also traditionally, um, you, I suppose your custom base, a lot of it is made up of large enterprises who you know, need SD-WAN solutions or need to connect different branches, all that kind of thing. Um, we had a question about, I guess, looking at, partly looking at the SME market. So Morgan's asked, when you talk about enterprise, there are two specific segments, one large enterprise and two, the SMEs. Are telcos focusing more on two now, so I guess the SMEs, and partnering with hyperscalers to bundle PaaS or SaaS with connectivity? Um, so there's a bit of a yes no question, but I guess broadly, how you know, how do you see SMEs as a potential customer segment for edge computing? So it's, a, it's a great question. Gordon, did uh, you want I, to go? I, I think that's part of why we're building out our 5G edge capability in the US is is to make it more accessible by by small to medium enterprises. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that when we talk uh, to multinational corporations, uh, we're having great conversations, but actually there's an awful lot of innovation coming out of the, the small enterprises. Um, and I think that's part of the excitement around this whole area. You've got a lot of people trying things that are new. So by putting that MEC capability, that 5G edge capability into our, into our macro network, um, and providing the ability to start delivering this stuff, it, it really is seeding a, a new market that we're, we're looking forward to taking to those multinational corps. And when, when you mean small enterprises there, are those like application developers or um, an, I guess more of an end enterprise? It could be anything. I mean, look, the, the whole thing about Industry 4.0 um, 5G, Edge, et cetera, it's changing everything, right? Um, all of a sudden you've got real-time enterprise that can be driven and that real-time enterprise can mean so many different things to different people. We, we spoke about use cases before. Half of the use cases that 5G and Edge are gonna drive haven't been invented yet. So watching some of these little projects going on, talking to people in the small to medium enterprises where they don't have you know, massive oil tankers to shift in terms of strategy, et cetera. That's where some of the excitement's coming from. You know, we're seeing a lot of startups that uh, that are starting to change the way that industries look at particular areas, health and safety and computer vision, intelligent video. It's it's driving the ability to re-imagine uh, business processes. And if we watch the smaller, um, enterprises working on things like that and adopt those kind of philosophies it it's going to help you know multinational corps as well yeah. and sorry go ahead true oh i think the only i want to point is i think that they're in our view it's two very different sales cycle in terms of selling to a, yeah. a large enterprise versus selling to an sme and the business model that you need to deploy and how in terms of from sales to operations to back to supervisioning has to be pretty different. And so if, as an organization, if you can you can be able to bifurcate that, then you can play that and then you, but it's not easy. So we we, we are a large enterprise, our systems are, are, are designed to that. We've been toying with SME, but 
it's a very different model and we're not sh we're in this, I think it's a, be a big decision. Where we could play in the SMEs is that we could make some of our tools. And I think this is what Gordon is. We definitely have tools that for some SMEs, the ones we who are more cloud native, they have the software guys to play with things and, they, and you give them sandbox and they can do things. Then, then we give them the tools that actually could be very good market. But some of the other SMEs, they're looking for like in a box type solution. And that's very, yeah. and this is where sort of the AWS first started. That's a different model, and that's not some place that we can easily compete against. So it, it, it has to pick our spots. I, I don't necessarily say that for us the SME is a, a solution. I think yes, it's a big growth market, but it's a very different model to pursue that. So we're 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 very careful about how we want to approach that market, given that our focus has been historically the large enterprise. Yeah, yeah it's interesting you you mentioned out of the box. So actually, one of the um, Jason from the audience. Um, mentioned that you know these out of the box edge solutions um, and I think he picked up Jen when you're talking about video analytics as a use case so he was sort of interested to know um, sort of where which other use cases or well, I mean I suppose there's two different questions there one is you know which use case are you focusing on and maybe are there any use cases where you feel that sort of edge in a box where you have the application as well as the underlying infrastructure and and the management um, all baked into one. Um, I'm not sure if is that something that you're exploring as a proposition, whether it's to SMEs or other enterprises. So Dahlia, I just I do want to address and say that um, the for for Vodafone, um, SMB is an incredibly important segment for us. And I think in Europe it's just an incredibly vibrant part of the economy as well um, and, and, and therefore you know a part of the economy that we're committed to innovate with and work with and support um, what's different or interesting about SMBs is when you work with a corporate or an MNC right all of them have an IT department all of them will have um, the sort of technical expertise to be able to choose the right technology platforms for their business with SMB, you get a whole range of diversity. There are some that just don't have an IT, that's not part of their DNA. And so they need to work with um, a company like a telco to, to act as, as almost their IT department to help them choose the right tools and the right infrastructure for their business. Some of them you know, might be ISVs, uh, for example, so they have technology at the heart of what they do. We'll have a very different conversation with them. Um, and, and, you know, particularly in Europe, the SMB space um, is super rich in terms of, of manufacturing and they'll have a different kind of operational technology expertise and, and, and need to work with us in, in a different way. And, I, and that's a long winded way to get to, you know, that I think that kind of manufacturing space is where providing perhaps a, 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 a um, an integrated, highly secure, performant network and cloud service is, is quite an attractive proposition and, and being a single provider of that as a service into those customers is, um, is, is quite important too. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in terms of use cases, do you see them being different for SMEs? Or is it sort of use case agnostic, that's actually what you need to be looking at when it comes to the SMB sector? Yeah, I think it, I think there's even more diversity because of the different technology expertise that you might find across those different groups. So, I, I mean, going back to Tree's point about about SaaS, right? For the the segment that doesn't have an IT department, um, I think looking at the SaaS estate and 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 those huge SaaS platforms that they might consume, will they benefit from running some of those SaaS services? From the edge, and is is that another kind of angle that that we drive into for that segment? I don't I don't know. I think it's fairly immature at this point in time, but perhaps that's where it will evolve for that particular segment. I'm not prepared to say that um, that SMBs won't benefit from edge. I I just think it, it's going to take a little bit more time to develop that that market. Mm -hmm. Um, Gordon, have you, I mean, this idea of the sort of edge in a box use cases, what are you, you know, first of all, are you, do you see that as a compelling proposition to have an application wrapped up in a, 
um, in a box, um, you know, with, with the edge compute provided? Um, or do you see that customers are looking for, you know, something that can support multiple use cases and tying, you know, yourself and the customer to maybe single applications may be difficult at this stage? I think Pareto's principle kicks in with a lot of this stuff. So if we take if we take computer vision, it's applicable across a multiple verticals. It's what you do with it once you look at a particular vertical that, that you start seeing variation. So you know I can use the same camera um, running a health and safety application, um, and I can use the same camera to do something like um, quality control in a production line. So you know, it's how you tune that computer vision, that intelligent video. The the other side that we're seeing uh, the edge coming into its own is, is with big data and being able to analyze uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and, and feedback, real time feedback loops into that production line. And, and that production line could be, you know, manufacturing, it could be it, it could be something quite fundamental. As I said earlier, I don't think we've seen all of the, the use cases explored yet. We're still finding out what real-time enterprise means to a lot of people. And, and of course, we've got a kit bag, we've got a whole lot of use cases we can sit down with a customer and run through, but half of that conversation is, is hoping that the customer will see some, some differences. We had a, an example where we took um, an insurance company through our 5G lab in London and we were showing them a retail uh, demonstration with uh, a whole lot of augmented reality. And, and the insurance customer came out of that saying, hey, that retail uh, solution is fantastic. So, you know, it, it changed the conversation from being what you would normally talk about one vertical to seeing some examples from another vertical that may be relevant. So if, if you see what I'm saying, I, I think there's a lot of commonality. Um, so. Uh, a solution in a box would make sense and it's what you do with that that's going to make it more valuable for your vertical your enterprise mm -hmm. and i guess you know you brought up that there, there's lots of use cases out there and they were they have different applications and i'd assume you know a computer vision based application for a manufacturing customer is going to be different to that for you know retail if they use your video analytics in retail so do you see that um, there are changes in how you look at partners, so particularly SaaS part application partners, and um, whether you are, you know, whether you see that you'll need to expand, you know, obviously the number of partnerships so you, as you target different verticals, or whether you'll focus on specific industries to make that more manageable? I think we're at that point right now, looking at, at our partner strategy for trying to solve a lot of the challenges that we're being posed with customers. Um, I, I think the jury's out on exactly what that partner strategy needs to look like. But you know, in the US, we have 400 partners that we're working with and with 5G and MEC examples. So you know, clearly there's, a, there's an appetite for investing and building those partnership models so that we can address multiple verticals and even in some cases on the west coast we've got a different partner ecosystem to what we might have on the east coast um, to deliver the same solution right so th there's a lot of dynamics to the question around partnership partnering strategy yeah. uh, the only thing I, I think so at the beginning of the presentation i mentioned that we're still trying to formulate our strategy. And I think the key part of that strategy is to, to try to prioritize what are the key uh, use cases and the, the ecosystem around those use cases. Because it's gonna be, it, the, the, you know, I think the mistake is to try to be all things to everybody. And, and, and first we'd have to know who our, you know, look at our core customer base, which are the, the major use cases. And, you know, a lot of it will be around some kind of a, a, a video camera, computer vision type, but and, and then you build around that and you build it and, and you focus on some of these use cases. That's the way I look at it, is is mm -hmm. sort of narrowing down to sort of the sort of the key use cases and then focus your business there rather than trying to do too much. And and that's the, the big part of the, the strategy part for us right now. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yeah, figuring out. Um, I know we've got five minutes left. I think one topic where um, it'd be interesting to get your views almost to round up the discussion is the intersection between 5G and Edge. Um, and I know, I suppose, Tree, with you and Tata, it's a little bit different to maybe Verizon Vodafone, who, um, you know, who have a mobile network, at least in some of their markets. But it'd be interesting to see what you think the dynamics or the, the influence of 5G will be. And this is partly, I guess, around say seeding the market and I think that's that's a given that 5G is creating excitement in the market but it's more so internally within your organizations how you know um, 5G and with other technologies you know you all mentioned this move to cloud native when will that um, you know what's the dynamic dynamic say between the networks the technology teams within your organizations who are building um, some cloud native expertise and, and um, technologies to build their own network and to manage the network in a cloud native way, say versus your, your teams in the enterprise space who are starting to leverage that but are more focused on the end application. Now, how do you see those two things um, coming together? Maybe it's a big question, but you know, just be interested even some initial thoughts of what you're seeing um, either in your organization or generally in the industry. Um, I don't know, Tree, if you want to start us off. Sure, I think uh, given we don't have a mobile network, I think that's clearly, so we, we tend to be much more focused on the, the managing the private network, right? So we believe that, that there is gonna be a, a strong need for, the corporate's gonna be exploring quite a bit on a private network. 5G will probably be one of the main, it's usually the, the main catalyst for that, that discussion. And, and that's where we think that we, there's a role for us to play so in helping them manage the, the private network along with their overall networking and, and cloud solution and so that is the, the sort of where we we tend to focus on and it's, again it's going to be about the overlay or this the, the platform that lets you manage help them manage their private the, with all the other uh components that they need to talk to in terms of regular cloud in terms of their branches private data center in terms of the devices in terms of the applications and so it's the one who can make it easier for them to be able to uh, roll out their private network and having someone help manage that private network is where we tend to be focusing on rather than, because we're not going to be able to sell the, the actual uh, spectrum or at least the spectrum and so on. So that's sort of the way we're approaching it. Great. Um, and Jen, obviously Vodafone is a huge mobile network. So, um, I mean, do you totally agree with you or do you see things slightly differently? No, um, I, I, um, I tend to agree. I mean, to the point we were talking about skills earlier, I mean, for me, the team, the technology team that I work with on our edge roadmap and delivery and build is the same team that's driving the, uh, the network evolution of our 4G and 5G network. It, it's one kind of team two separate delivery engines right we're not um we're not combining the concept of what we build to run customer workloads with what we build to run our own network workloads they're considered very separate things for a variety of reasons that uh that, that i'm sure um everyone uh can 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 understand so um yeah same same team same intellect same skills same kind of thinking but different programs. Okay. And Gordon, just to round us off. So we see um, private uh, wireless networking, so private 5G as as one of the catalysts for bringing this real-time enterprise that I, I talk about. And, and that is a combination of 5G standalone and the mobile edge compute. So you know, countries like Germany, you've got hundreds of enterprises procuring their own private spectrum from the, the German regulator. And there's a great opportunity there for, we see a great opportunity for us to, to come in and help with that connectivity edge uh, 5G ecosystem piece. So we, we think it's really exciting. And you know, Germany's um, the first country, that there are many more lining up with private spectrum. Mm -hmm. Just kind of that private edge opportunity. Great, well, I can see Andrew's joined, so I think that means um, I have to shut up probably and hand over to him. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't mean that. I just thought I would come in and say thank you to everyone um, on the panel. And Dahlia, for you for your work putting this together. It's been a 
fascinating conversation. We're coming to the hour and like to respect people's time. So appreciate there's been some questions that we haven't uh, totally covered. We will do our best. We live on questions um, as deal partners. That's what we do. So we will do our best to, to think about those. And we will also try and get what we can from the panelists help to, to answer those where we can and we haven't yet. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you especially to Jennifer. Gordon and Tree and Fam, a really fascinating panel. And thank you to all the attendees uh, and for your questions too. Have a great day and um, see you all soon. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye bye. Bye.